Marcus Tullius Cicero is considered by many to be among the greatest orators in human history. Cicero was a politician and a philosopher who served the people in the Senate in the late Roman Republic. His works are so important that they have been studied and analyzed and dissected and emulated by some of the most influential leaders in history. His works were so important that among the first works to be published on a printing press after the Gutenberg Bible was a philosophical treatise by Cicero. And while his words are relatively well remembered, especially given that he died more than two millennia ago, his life is much less remembered. Many people don't realize, for example, how vehemently he was hated by his enemies because of the power of his oratory. And they orchestrated his death far away from the city that he strove his entire life to protect. The life and death of Cicero is history that deserves to be remembered. Rome, the city at the center of the vast Roman Empire, has a storied history. There were multiple mythological tales of its founding. One says two brothers, Romulus and Remus, were cast out by their power-hungry uncle and raised by a she-wolf on the side of what would become Rome. They quarreled about what to call the city. Romulus killed Remus and named the settlement after himself. Another major myth is that the city was founded by the Trojan hero Aeneas, son of the goddess Aphrodite, when he was fleeing the sack of Troy. Whatever kernels of truth were concealed in these myths, a binding thread between them is that Rome was a city founded on struggle and blood. The Roman legions, highly trained and organized foot soldiers, were a scourge of the ancient world, backed by powerful politicians in the Roman Senate and later emperors. The legions conquered vast territories across what would become Europe. It was one of the largest civilizations the world had ever seen. Despite its sprawling lands, the people of Rome developed a cultural identity through language and customs that they spread throughout the conquered territory. They also excelled at adopting some religions and customs of the conquered to bring countries into the fold. For example, when Rome subjugated Greece, they adopted the myths of the gods of the Greeks. The Greek god of the sky and storms, Zeus, was renamed Jupiter. The goddess of love, Aphrodite, was titled Venus, and so forth. The letters S, P, Q, R appeared on the banners of the conquering legions. This represented Senatus Populus Gay Romanus, which translates literally to the Senate and people of Rome. This curious statement means that the Roman Republic consisted of the relationship between the Roman Senate and the governed, one in equal balance with the other, or at least that was the ideal. It was as a senator in the government of Rome that Cicero made history. Cicero was what was known as a new man which meant that he was the first of his family to serve as a Roman senator, and later a consul, one of the highest offices a politician could hold in the Republic. Unlike other Roman politicians from well-established families, he built his career only on his own accomplishments, and so talked those up as much as he could. Because of this so-called self-promotion, Cicero was seen as self-absorbed by some. He first made his reputation through arguing court cases, wielding his Latin precisely and like a knife, driving to the essential heart of the matter in a way that his contemporaries admired. Because of his skill with words, some historians credit Cicero with the construction of how Latin was spoken throughout antiquity. The forms he used were copied by others, wishing to master the language as he had. The use of the Latin language was an art that could be used to raise a man's social standing in Rome. Talented orators and writers were celebrated not just for what they said, but the manner in which they said it. Some of Cicero's sayings have become incredibly popular. Take, for example, a line attributed to Cicero that is repeated by bookworms everywhere. If you have a library and a garden, you have everything you need. Cicero's letters, speeches, and writings were carefully preserved by more than one person in ancient Rome, including Marcus Tullius Tiro, a former slave from Cicero's family who was freed and continued to work for him. Later preservation was assisted by the Catholic Church, who believed Cicero was a noble pagan and therefore worthy of saving from the shadows of obscurity. In some ways, it is a miracle that any of Cicero's legacy survived, considering how vehemently he was hated by some of his enemies. One of Cicero's greatest political enemies was Lucius Sergius Catalina, or Catiline. Catiline was from an established Roman family whose star and fortune had faded for some time. He was accused of various crimes during life, including adultery with a Vestal Virgin, a woman whose life and sexuality had been ritualistically given to the gods. Cicero later suggested that Catiline wasn't killed for the offense with the Vestal Virgin because he had bribed the judges at his trial. After losing the election for consul to Cicero, probably because his policy of universal debt forgiveness was unpopular with Rome's leading men, Catiline concocted a plot to overthrow the Republic a plot which Cicero unmasked in what is considered one of his greatest political acts. In revealing the plot, 
Cicero gave a series of speeches against Catiline in the Senate. One of the most remembered lines is, Oh, the times, oh, the morals, in which Cicero was bemoaning how far a member of one of Rome's leading families had fallen. The speeches combined to turn the Senate against Catiline, who subsequently fled Rome. Shortly thereafter, Catiline died, fighting at the front of his troops in a type of suicide by combat, which was just as well because Cicero had pushed a decree through the Senate that called for Catiline's death. That death sentence wasn't particularly popular or even technically legal at the time and eventually led to Cicero's own banishment from Rome. Even Julius Caesar, who was in the Roman Senate at the time, thought that banishment was enough punishment for Catiline, but Cicero had little patience or mercy for those he believed to be the enemies of Rome. In fact, when Caesar reached out to Cicero in the formation of the first triumvirate, which was essentially a loose political alliance, Cicero refused to join. Cicero turned his back on the group of Caesar, Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, and Marcus Licinius Crassus, three of the most powerful men of his time, because he thought the triumvirate was against the values of the Roman Republic. Unfortunately for Cicero, it was the first in a series of missteps he made in choosing political allies, seeming to value ideals over more pragmatic political solutions. Cicero was eventually pardoned from his forced exile by Caesar and returned to Rome. He was not involved with the now infamous assassination of Julius Caesar on the Ides of March, but Cicero wasn't a fan of the dictator either. Of Caesar, who was known to be vain about his balding head of hair, Cicero said, When I notice how carefully arranged his hair is, and when I watch him adjusting the parting with one finger, I cannot imagine that this man could conceive of such a wicked thing as to destroy the Roman constitution. And Cicero had misgivings about the amount of power Caesar wielded. Dictator for life was an unconstitutional position which Caesar had occupied. After Caesar was killed, historians say, Marcus Junius Brutus, one of the killers, raised a dagger covered in Caesar's blood and called out Cicero's name with a directive to restore the Republic. Cicero would have been in the Senate that day, standing with his colleagues, watching the slaughter of the dictator for life. If it did indeed happen, Cicero's response to this legendary appeal was not recorded. Politics in the Senate were tricky after Caesar's assassination. Cicero and Caesar's longtime political ally, Mark Antony, were the most powerful politicians in Rome during that period, with Cicero running things in the Senate and Antony acting as consul and carrying out the final wishes of Caesar. Their relationship became antagonistic when Cicero accused Antony of taking things too far in his remembrance of Caesar. In another series of famous speeches called the Philippics, Cicero denounced Antony, attacking Antony's latest political actions as well as his personal life and relationships. Antony was incensed, and Cicero permanently lost another powerful political ally. Then, when Caesar's will named his nephew, Gaius Octavius Thurinus, also known as Octavian and eventually as Caesar Augustus, as his adopted son and heir, Cicero made another fatal misstep. He thought Octavian, a young man and relative newcomer to Roman politics, would be simple to steer in whatever direction the veteran senator chose. Cicero was wrong. Of Octavian, Cicero said, the young man should be given praise, distinctions, and then be disposed of. Octavian, who would go on to rule as emperor in his own right, probably heard this witticism and never forgot it. Octavian, Antony, and a general named Marcus Lepidus formed a second triumvirate and found as much, if not more, success as the first alliance. They set up a prescription, essentially death warrants for their political enemies, and among those marked for death was Cicero. Antony sent a group of hand-picked men to kill Cicero, who had fled Rome when it became apparent that the winds of fortune were against him. The soldiers found Cicero at his seaside villa. He was in a palanquin, apparently trying to flee, when the soldiers arrived. According to historians, Cicero said, There is nothing proper about what you are doing, soldier, but do try to kill me properly. The men cut off his head and also his hands and brought them back to Rome, where the grisly trophies were displayed in the Senate, at the very place where Cicero had experienced some of his greatest triumphs and delivered his memorable speeches. Antony's wife, Fulvia, took a further step of pulling out Cicero's tongue and sticking pins through it in a final petty act of revenge against the man who she felt so maligned her husband. The senator, who had once saved Rome from rebellion, was dead. It is difficult to overstate how important Marcus Tilius Cicero was to the development of language and culture. Even if you've never heard his name, you've almost certainly heard his words. For example, er grotto dum anime est Spes esse dicitur, roughly translated, where there's life, there's hope.
Cicero, who once famously helped to rediscover the forgotten tomb of the Greek scholar Archimedes, understood the importance of remembering the past. To be ignorant of what happened before you were born, he said, is to remain forever a child. And it's up to us to remember the life of Cicero because, as he said, the life of the dead is placed in the memory of the living. And it's doubly important that we remember Cicero's death, because while he might not always have been right, he always fought for what he believed was right. He said, I have always believed that unpopularity earned by doing what is right is not unpopularity at all, but glory. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.